Welcome everybody, it is Jay Bear from Convince and Convert, joined today by my pal and soon to be yours, Ms. Sally Hogshead, author of the New York Times best-selling <laughs> book, How the World Sees You. Sally, congratulations on that yeah. achievement. It's great to see you. Uh, Thank thanks you. for being uh, here on Convince and Convert. Thank you, Jay. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate your coaching along the way. Well, it is uh, it is a big hill to climb, as I know, and you now know. And I cannot believe that you do not have a glass of wine in your hand uh, <laughs> right now. You you look remarkably fresh for somebody who just climbed the mountain of book pre-sales. Because I got all the emails from you and everything else. I know you and you and your fantastic team, and, and seriously, your team is great. Um, uh, I know how hard uh, you all worked. So uh, congratulations, and, and you're looking good. Like, did you take a little break, a little a little vacation? You know what, I have to tell you, this weekend was my first weekend. I took the whole weekend with the kids, and we did all kinds of awesome stuff. We went to gym some on Sunday. We we, we played games. I mean, I feel I, I like I'm ready. I'm back. Very but nice. I wasn't, I wasn't Friday. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Um, I think a lot of people watching this video who are uh, frequent visitors to the Convince and Convert blog uh, are somewhat familiar with the book and the premise because we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of blog readers and social media contacts of mine take the pre-assessment. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But for anybody who's not familiar with the book or the premise of how the world sees you, maybe you could set that up for them. Sure, sure. There are certain situations that give you a huge advantage in communication. And when you can focus on these types of situations, you're very likely to be impressive and influential with your listener. And there are patterns within your communication that if you could predict which types of situations are going to put you at a real advantage so that you're seen in the absolute most positive light, then you can be very strategic about how you communicate with clients, coworkers, partners, etc. On the other hand, there are other situations that put you at a real disadvantage advantage in which you're very unlikely to be seen in a positive light. You're not going to win. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be demoralized. So I took my branding background, my decade of, of work with brands like Coca-Cola, Nike, and I applied it to personality and how we communicate online and in job interviews and in meetings with prospects. And I found that there are really clear patterns within our communication that if you can understand how people see you at your best, then you can simply focus on those areas where you're most primed to succeed and avoid the areas that are gonna be like quicksand. Well, and, and who couldn't benefit from that? I mean, everybody in every in every job in every circumstance. Tell me, uh, because of the kind of work that we do here at Convince and Convert, how that um, extends to, to social media. I mean, one of the things I love about the book is you talk about this sort of tagline for yourself, right? Yeah. The sort of tagline for life. And, and so much of what we do in social is somewhat um, reduced down to a tagline, right? It's it's like your Twitter bio, your Facebook bio, your, you know, here's what the party line is. Um, can you use your fascination advantage, how the world sees you and and apply that in social media? Yes, that, that that's that's actually why, how it was originally uh, created. When I first been my, began my career as an advertising copywriter, my favorite part of my job was the process of helping a brand find the perfect words to describe itself. Social media hadn't even been invented at that time, but there's that's never right. been a time when we need to understand how do you hone in and cut to the chase and immediately understand how to front load your value than a world that supposedly has a nine second attention span. So imagine that experience of looking at your Twitter feed or at, or, or at TweetDeck and the, you know, there's a fire hose of information coming at you. There's, there's simply too much. You feel distracted. The, the uh, One tweet starts to blend into another. Well, it's the same way in the job market. It's the same way in, in conversations. It's the same way we're trying to pick up with somebody at the, at the bar seat next to you. Anytime you communicate, you have to figure out how can you win in that immediate first moments of an interaction. And so I took my training as an advertising copywriter and I applied it over to understanding how we communicate in the modern world. And what I found is that your personality, once we can measure your personality, then we can tell you the five adjectives that are going to be your most effective way of communicating. And we literally, when you, when, when you, when you read the book, you take the assessment, which Jay's giving you for free, and it literally gives you the, the actual five words 
that you need based on the, the patterns hidden within your communication style so that you can literally cut and paste this and put it on your LinkedIn yeah. profile or you can adapt it or it might just be a mindset. It might be that you, you could say to yourself, I am most likely to win in situations in which I'm going to be creative, out of the box, social, energizing. That, that would be mine. I'm a catalyst. So I know that when I'm communicating with my Twitter followers or, or um, writing a new business proposal, I will be seen in my most positive way and I will deliver the most value when I can be creative, out of the box, energizing, and social. I'm not going to deliver value when I have to be meticulous, analytical, strategic, methodical. That's, you know, I can do it, but in, I'm at a real disadvantage if that's what they want. So in the same way, when you take the assessment, it tells you the top five advantages that you need, and then you go to the book, and it shows you exactly how to apply that in creating a tagline for your personality. Well, and the book is is remarkable because it's very comprehensive. There's all kinds of exercises and charts and checklists. And as you said, it, it really lays it right out there for the reader to say, this is the recipe for your success based on how people see you and, and, and how you are perceived. And it is amazing. It, it doesn't really leave any stones unturned. Uh, you know, I'm like, it's a lot of work to put together a book like that. Uh, and it's it's quite an impressive uh, piece of, uh, you know, piece of content to give somebody and say, look, this can change the way you think about everything in your world, not just in business, but in life and in relationships. I mean, that's, you know, that's some pretty heady stuff. I mean, that's no joke. Do you use Jay, in your, in your process with your company, when you work with clients, do you ever do um, what in advertising is called a creative brief? Of course, where, yep. Yeah, okay, so imagine that what, it, it, so a creative brief is not telling you exactly how to do it. A creative brief is telling you where you're going to be most likely to win. So the idea is that you're trying to take things off the table so you can hone in on those areas that are going to be the sweet spot, the best opportunities. That's really what this is doing is you take the assessment, you go to the book, and it shows you step by step, here is the creative brief for your personality so that you can be very, very strategic in how you approach it. My favorite little bit is on page 365, and it, it's the the anthem method um, that you can just, if, if you only have 10 minutes, if you just open up the book to this, to this exercise, when you open up the book here, you can, um, it says, let's talk about what your differences are. I mean, who cares about your strengths? In a commoditized world, strengths don't really matter because it forces you to follow your competition. Instead, let's identify how you're different. What adjective describes how you're different? And then it shows you step by step how to find that adjective. And then you pair your adjective with a noun. And the noun describes what you do best. So your anthem is your adjective plus a noun that shows, it kind of illuminates the way like a creative brief would to how you should be communicating with your followers, with your friends, with your, your clients, your fans, et cetera, so that you don't have to try to be all things to all people. You can just do more of what you're already doing right. So what's an example <laughs> of an anthem like that? Well, why don't we talk about somebody who's very different from, from, um, from you or from me. There's, um, there, we have a key player on our team. Our name is Corey, and Corey is our, our content manager. We have a huge amount of content. It's, uh, when she first came on the job, it was very disorganized. Um, it was kind of like this bit in Dropbox, this bit on a hard drive. And so there, th we needed a methodology to organize it, categorize it, tag it, et cetera. And we're, I mean, we're talking thousands of pages. So Corey, is, Corey was hired specifically because she's amazing with details. And um, she's meticulous. She's great with follow through. Um, she's very detailed. It's almost like she's laser sharp in how she can remember where everything is. Now, that's very different than me. So when Corey works with me, she's not replicating me. She's optimizing me. And her anthem is meticulous. Meticulous is her adjective that she got from the report. Follow through is the noun that she got from her list of nouns that are in the book. So how she's different is that she's not all over the place. She doesn't focus on um, being all things to all people. Her job is to be meticulous. And she and follow through is what she does best and is intensely valuable to me and to the company. So when Corey is thinking about how can she be most valuable when she comes into work, if she delivers meticulous follow through, my God, I mean, my heart could sing. Yeah, yeah. boom. Yeah. But if Corey came in and she was trying, let's take the adjective meticulous, if Corey was trying to be untraditional or entrepreneurial or friendly or nurturing, well, she could be those things, 
But those aren't going to be really that Meticulous. area that, yeah. that we need and that she does best and that for her is a wellspring. And the same is true for, for all of us. There's certain adjectives that describe what people really want from us and what we are naturally suited, custom built to deliver. And so if you can build your content around that, your career around that, your business around that, then it becomes really easy to just keep more of what you're already doing right. And by focusing that in with an anthem to using your Twitter bio, you know, you've only got 140 characters or your LinkedIn opening sentence, mm -hmm. imagine having those perfect words to be able to say to somebody, here's why you should work with me, here's how I'm different, and here's how I'm best. And um, it just makes people feel more relaxed. You know how great, I don't deliver a meticulous follow through so I can relax. <laughs> it's not, it's not, not Somebody right. else has got that covered, yeah. I love it, I love it. Um, one of the things that, that we did in the run up to the release uh, of your book was um, we had Convince to Convert readers uh, who wanted to take the assessment do so and we had what six or seven hundred people uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who read the blog actually went through the how the world sees you process the assessment that Sally has been talking about and we thought it would be really interesting to kind of get a handle on obviously everybody has their own strengths and, and there's how many different uh, uh, categories are 44 there, yes, there, there are seven different main advantages, yep. and this is your, your primary means of communication. Yep. And then there's a secondary, seven secondary, so together there's 49 total. 49. So 49 potential uh, boxes that, that you can fit into. Uh, and so obviously people run the gamut of those, but we thought it would be fascinating to see where the majority of convince and convert readers lie on that continuum. And is there uh, a, a, a grouping, are there, are there different uh, characteristics that are more likely to be present among people who read this blog and follow me and social media, et cetera. So what did you find out, Sally? Well, you're, the, the population of people who took the assessment is different than the average population. And uh, we, we saw there were, there were two things we saw that were important. Here's what the, this is what the matrix looks like. It's inside the book. Um, there were, there were two advantages that we saw that your, that, that your community has. The first one is prestige, which is all about higher standards. Prestige personalities know how to improve things. They are competitive. They like to overachieve. They like to um, constantly see how can I improve what I'm doing? How can I up my game? Which makes sense, Jay, because you, you, you're a maestro, right? Maestro yeah. Victor? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you tend to, people tend to attract in your community who you naturally are. So that makes sense because you're very focused on how do we get a better result tomorrow than we did today. The second thing that we noticed is they score very high on mystique. Mystique is all about watching and observing, being able to see all those little pieces and put them in order in a way that's almost like a chess game. And th this is uh, mystique. People in social media circles tend to score much higher on mystique because they're really good at taking everything in and seeing and to be able to build conversations strategically and to look at things in terms of a plan. So the, the third thing that we noticed was that your group tends to have a disadvantage in situations that are rigidly process oriented, which is the trust advantage. Trust personalities, people who score very high on trust, unlike your group and unlike me, I have dormant trust. How can we how can we tweak things and make it better? So one of the things I thought was so fascinating about that exercise and getting all the people to fill out the assessment in, in my community and many other communities is that it gives everybody a taste of the book before the book comes out, which is as a as an author and as a marketer, as a content marketer, is a brilliant, brilliant strategy. Um, is truly fantastic. But you were telling me before we before we began here that that you actually changed your own approach to content and book marketing uh, in in the very late stages compared uh, compared to speaking very late stages of the book promotion process. Tell me about that a little bit. It's, it's interesting. Well, so I want you to think of traditional media. Imagine, imagine I'm, I'm, a, I'm a client and I buy print ads. Well, a print ad is a one-way communication. It's not a conversation. It's, a, it's expensive and it's a kind of a traditional way of thinking about how, how we, we bring people in and create the sale, right? And that's why it got replaced by social media, because social media is very customized, it's targeted, it's interactive, and the content can be updated constantly. Well, we realized that we were treating our launch before we began, before we introduced the book, we were treating it more like a traditional media buy, because we weren't creating a dialogue. 
So we did three things that were pretty radical shifts along the way that were very uncomfortable, but um, not only taught us a lot, but got helped us get the results that we wanted. The first thing that we did was we had always charged for the assessment. It's thirty-seven dollars a person, and when you buy the book, you get one assessment. So we were kind of coming from a place of scarcity because this was a product that we sold. Sure, yeah. But we said instead of creating a barrier to getting a taste of this, what if we did the opposite and not only made it free, but actually encouraged people to share? And I'm going to be honest, my team totally freaked out. <laughs> but it was like. How could you possibly take the thing that is sold on the shelf as that's yeah. our inventory? Yeah, there's there's utility and then there's insanity, right? There's a fine line there. It, it, so, but I knew from branding that if you can give somebody an experience and they find value in that experience, they want to come back for more. So I said, let's create something that we called Project Fascination. And you can check it out at projectfascination.com. We invited people to sign up and um, throughout the summer, they can you, you put in your name, you immediately get a code, and the code allows you to share with 100 people, your Twitter followers, your team at work. We were finding people were donating their code to a nonprofit. Cool. And, and so what that allowed, it, was a, it was a complete shift of pay it forward and help somebody else find their highest value. So that helped us. We, we, we now have um, between uh, about 2,000 people a day who come into that program. So that helped us scale quickly. Another thing we did is we had a whole bunch of what are called galley copies. Galley copies are um, there where it's a paperback version that only goes out to the media. And um, if I buy this from the publisher, you can see it has my notes on it. If I buy this from the publisher, it was $2. If I buy this from the publisher, it's $20. So we said, let's have 6,000 of these. So we created buy one, get one. If you buy, buy a by a produced copy and you get a galley copy signed. And the last thing we did is we created very, very targeted messages that um, that were specifically to the to um, to to the personality type of the person. So Jay, you are very achievement oriented, you're results oriented, you want to know what's going to be the outcome. You um, you don't really want to get in the weeds and you don't want the touchy feely thing. You want to know what's the result, right? So I should communicate to you differently. I should make sure my wife is coming in here to hear this because she's going to be she's nodding her head on the other side of the store. So imagine if I'm if I'm if I'm sharing about this book, I wouldn't want to be like, oh, this book's going to make you feel warm and squishy inside, and I shouldn't say, oh, this is going to help you prevent problems. Instead, I should say, hey, this book is going to help you get better results, and you're going to be more competitive and more respected within your marketplace. Well, for you, if I can give you some tangible examples of that, it's like ding, ding, ding. And so we did that with each of the seven personality types. For the passion personalities, we talked about here, here's, here's how you're going to feel when you read the book. And for detail personalities, we made it all about the research behind it and the, and the rigor of this system. And that was really when it was doing those three things, project fascination, buy one, get one, and, um, and, and highly customized messages that but then finally, it was like the breakthrough happened, and we reached that critical mass. And and the messages, the the seven sort of types of messages, were all deployed in email sort of marketing automation style, right? So you right. get a message, and then a week later or two weeks later, or whatever the sequence was. That that is, uh, I think, there's a couple of inter- important lessons there. One. Uh, that's a lot of work, right? I mean, that's a lot of emails to write uh, seven times X. What is it? You know, seven times seven messages. It's fifty different emails or something like that to write. That's a lot of that's a lot of effort. Uh, but I think that the you know setting aside the work and and success takes work. But uh, I just had a conversation about this yesterday with somebody that you know we're we're in this strange place now where everybody's busy. Right. It's just a it's just a degree of how busy you are. You know, there's busy and then there's like hella busy. Um, but but nobody, nobody is like, you know what? I don't I got nothing to do. I'll, you know, whatever. You know, and nobody says, geez, I wish I could get more email. Uh, yeah. You know, so none of that happens. And so but what I what I told this person uh, and I think it really applies here is that relevancy creates time. People say they don't have enough time. They don't have enough time. But if so, if you send them something that is absolutely spot on relevant, magically that time is found. That's and, utility. Yeah, it is. It really is. And so, and so, uh, I think the fact that you took the time to make it hyper relevant and hyper targeted, people say, "Oh, I, I will actually open that email. I will read that email. I will buy the book. I will tell people to buy the book." Uh, because it, it's speaking to them as opposed to an audience at large. And, and obviously, you know, having so many people 
uh, work on uh, Project Fascination, you know, it also builds a tremendous list for you for the next Sally Hogshead production, etc. So just the ability to create that size of audience ongoing is uh, is going to pay some real dividends, not just on this project, but down the road, of course. And it all begins with with be with being able to take huge risks to find out what's on the other side. Do you remember when people started doing social media? And I would have these conversations with, but this was back when I was a creative director and I had these conversations with clients. So it was like, yeah, you have to post like three times a day. <laughs> and and they, they would say, well, why can't I just write one print ad and be done for the month? And it's, <laughs> well, you can either have the biggest marketing budget or you can be the most fascinating. But if you don't have the biggest marketing budget, you better be fascinating. And if you, you know, if you can't buy that awareness, you have to earn that awareness. And the same is true for all of us as marketers, as job interviewers, as people who have busy kids and busy spouses, that if we want our messages to break through and really make a difference and be heard and get action, then we have to be the guardian of that message. And it doesn't mean working harder, it means working smarter. So instead of earning the money to buy a print ad, I would spend the time to write the emails that were then customized. It was just a trade-off. Instead of biggest budget, it was yeah. most fascinating. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. So do you find that there, when you've got the, the 49 different um, uh, buckets, are those, I mean, do you grade on a curve? Are those evenly distributed or are there um, certain uh, buckets within there that, that are much more likely to be uh, common uh, amongst people who take the assessment, not just in my audience, but, but across everybody who uses the assessment tool? There are some that are really rare. And those are the people who are often the most valuable. Being, in, in other words, if everybody in your company yeah. is really good at a certain thing and you're good at this, well, then you should become more intensely valuable. The problem that happens within companies is there is a value judgment on certain type, types of outcome because managers want to replicate themselves. Yeah. And so the key to a great team is you don't want similarities. You want differences. You don't want strengths. You want to find what are the ways in which people can add unique value so that you don't want everybody who's like the go-getter, performer, cold caller. You need some people who are great with follow-through and execution and implementation. And when you can work those together, these two may not be naturally the ones who want to go and hang out for a beer after work. But if you can build the team that way, then you can create a population or a recipe that's going to be most effective. So when we go into companies like AT&T and GE and we we measure their population and then we compare it to the average population and we can compare it to other industries then we can say um, uh, like for example there's a fortune 100 um, fortune 10 life insurance company that we went into and um, they, their problem was that they that that uh, people were people were staying so there was a long tenure among their employees but there was no innovation and they weren't bringing young people into the brand and then we tested them and Guess what? You know they 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 were disproportionately good at trust, so great at patterns, but disproportionately low at creativity and innovation. So we just showed them how to hire differently and how to how to bring it out in people that already had it, but were probably getting squashed. Oh, that's that's amazing a case study, and I suspect organizations like that have this nagging suspicion that something is is misaligned but when you see it broken down that way when you see it here's your entire workforce and how they tend to clump uh, in an area that doesn't necessarily breed innovation uh, i'm sure the light bulb really goes on when you see it on paper like that yeah it's different it, they could do myers-briggs or disc or strengths finder yeah. and they could see how their employees see the world but this is showing something different because it's not through the lens of psychology yeah so it's, this is how does the world see those employees? How does a customer yeah. see the employee? How do the employees see each other? And when, um, when you understand how the world sees you at your best, it's very easy for you to go towards those areas that are, are, are naturally suited and avoid the areas or at least put caution tape around the areas where you're not going to succeed. Well, it has been a fantastic journey to watch you unfurl this over the last uh, many months, actually many years. I know that you've been working on this project legitimately many, many years. And so I'm so very, very happy for you and proud thank of you and your team. It's really, really fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. it, it, it I just I, I love watching what you're doing and I love watching the things that you invent and the way that you do it and how you have built the community that you've built and and I think you're, you're leading so much of this conversation so I, I'm I'm thrilled and honored to be able to talk to you about it thanks well if there's if there's one of the boxes that's essentially I just make shit up and see if it works that's essentially what I am I'm not sure what that one's called um, but the make shit up guy is uh, is the one 
yeah, in the next edition of the book. Um, seriously, though, I, I suspect a lot of people um, in the Convince and Convert community have purchased the book because they got the assessment and they loved it. If you haven't, uh, I really recommend that you do. You will get a lot out of it. And if you don't like the book, which you will, but if you don't, I'll send you one of my books for free. And uh, and if you don't like my book or Sally's book, then I don't know what to do. I can't help you. Uh, then we'll send you somebody else's book. Uh, we'll, 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 I'll get a stack. We'll send you one of Joe Palizzi's books. I got some of those laying around. We'll hook you up one way or the other. Uh, Sally, thanks so much. Uh, we'll talk soon. And also, if you get a chance to see Sally uh, up on stage, uh, she is uh, one of the finest public speakers uh, ever in this country. And I don't say that like so uh, she'll be out there out on the road talking about uh, how the world sees you and fascination so if you get a chance to see Sally uh, anywhere near you uh, take that opportunity I really uh, can't recommend it highly enough thank you thanks my friend see you later yeah.